Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Sunday, June the 13th, 2021. It is currently 4.41 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the sanctuary here at Victory Baptist Church, which is located in the middle of nowhere, Texas. Thank you so much for tuning in because this is about to be the first episode and what is going to be a very important, I can tell you controversial, maybe unexpected, crazy. I, I, I don't even know what to call this. It's going to be a, a very interesting series. Maybe, maybe I should just downplay. It's going to be a very interesting series This is going to be episode one and what will be a very interesting series, and I hope you are ready. I would challenge you to have the following things. I would challenge you to have a Bible. I would challenge you to have a notebook, something to write with, definitely something to drink. My drink of choice here is, well, Dasani, because if it's it's not Dasani, it's not water, all right? So an ice-cold bottle of Dasani. Yes. And I here, I, now you don't need all of these things, but here on the table, I've got two tables right here. Let's see what I have here. I have catechisms. I have confessions of faith. I have Bible dictionaries, have Bible encyclopedias, have Bibles, have commentaries. I have uh, an interlinear uh, here in case we need to do any work in Greek or Hebrew. I have Thayer's lexicon. Let's see, I don't even know. I've got so many tools and resources here that... Um, I think we're going to have everything we need because we're going to be getting into a lot of doctrine, a lot of theology. We may end up in in getting into church history. So let me first explain what we're doing. Uh, Then I'm going to explain how we're going to do it. And then we're going to get started. Are you you ready? I think that makes sense. What we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and then we're going to get started. What we are going to be doing is we're going to be examining basically a response by Bethel Church. Now, Bethel Church is located in Redding, California. It is one of the most influential churches in the United States of America. Some may say it's one of the most influential churches in the world, all right? It's a very influential church. Whether you agree with it or disagree with Bethel Church, you cannot deny its influence. Now, influence can be good. Influence can be bad. What we have to figure out, what we are going to do is we're going to be examining what Bethel Church is responding to, what they are saying, and we're going to be examining it, listen, from a biblical, theological perspective. Obviously, we're going to be uh, looking at it also from a church history perspective, okay? Now, here, let me explain a little bit. First, a little bit of background, all right? So we're going to be examining a response by Bethel Church. That's what we're going to be doing. But let me give you a little background about Bethel Church. Bethel Church is an American non-denominational, hyper-charismatic megachurch in Redding, California, with over 11,000 members. The church is listed as a non-denominational, charismatic, Pentecostal church. And from my understanding... No one has corrected me here, but from my understanding, they used to be associated with the Assemblies of God. I do not know why they left or when they left, but they are now a non-denominational, charismatic, Pentecostal church listed by some as hyper-charismatic. It was founded or established in 1952. Um, and you see, the church has a membership of over 11,000 and weekly attendance, depending on what source you look up is, is somewhere over 8,000. I've seen the weekly attendance listed as 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, all, all, I think even all the way up to 11,000. So, um, somewhere over 8,000, the church runs the Bethel school of supernatural ministry with over 2000 students annually. All right. Now, what are some of the things that we need to know about this uh, about this church? Well, they're charismatic. They're Pentecostal. So you already know what to expect right there. You, you've got some basic ideas, right? One of the fun, a couple of fundamental principles within Pentecostal charismatic theology, all right? Here's some basic principles. That divine healing is guaranteed for the here and now. We're not just simply saying that that but because of what Christ did, we're, we are guaranteed a, a new body where there'll be no more pain, no more sickness, and no more death in, in heaven. But 
right now on this earth, by his stripes we are healed. All you have to do is believe it and claim it and you can be physically healed from whatever disease. It doesn't matter. You can you can grow back. If you lose an arm, you can grow back an arm. If you die, you, you, someone can have you resurrected. Basically, you should be healed from everything because by his stripes we're healed because of what Christ did on the cross. Physical healing is guaranteed right now while you live on this earth. All right, that's a pretty basic teaching within the charismatic Pentecostal world. Obviously, another very important doctrine within that world is that God is, now they would they, they, they love to try to play some word games here, but I'm going to state it this way. The God, they believe God is still speaking to us outside of Scripture. They would argue that God is speaking to us in Scripture, but he's also speaking to us outside of Scripture. In what ways? They would argue maybe an, an inside you know, still small voice that you have to try to decipher. Is that God speaking or is that my feelings? Or Okay, so that could be that way. Through dreams, through visions, maybe even through an audible voice and through all kinds of other, you know, um, experiences, right? They all, typically in the charismatic world, another important principle, I gave you those are the two main ones. Uh, divine healing is guaranteed for here and now. And God is speaking to us outside of the scriptures or in addition to the scriptures. It's not scripture alone. It's scripture plus these other ways of revelation, all right? Um, they would also uh, usually hold to the idea of speaking in tongues, uh, that tongues is some kind of prayer language and that that someone can speak in a tongue and then someone supposedly gives an interpretation. And that is also the way God is speaking to people. Those are some of the basic elements here. Um, just reading from a couple of things. Uh, Bethel Church focuses on miracles. As I've already stated, they teach that all miracles described in the Bible can be performed by believers today and happens on a regular basis, including faith healing of everything from curing cancer to regrowing limbs, raising the dead, speaking in tongues, casting out demons, and prophecy. Their services may have congregants laughing uncontrollably, lying on the floor, shaking, staggering, screaming, and dancing, which they teach are signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Leaders claim to, uh, claim to have witnessed angels appearing and balls of electricity that people throw in the air. Uh, one of the most well-known uh, phenomenon is a cloud of, of which, is claimed to, which is claimed to be gold dust or gold glitter that have been seen falling from the roof of the auditorium. The church has uploaded videos to their YouTube channel and call it a glory cr uh, cloud. Um, let's see, what else do they uh, talk about? Uh, the senior pastor is referred to as an apostle by his followers. Right now, there's all kinds of, of issues going on there. Um. What are some other things? Oh, you may also know Bethel Church for the Wake Olive, where the two-year-old girl died. And instead of burying her, they, they believed that she was going to be resurrected. And they had these services, and I think they streamed them live on the internet, Wake Olive. And of course, Olive wasn't resurrected, um, which, yeah. And all kinds of controversy arose from that. Um, in 2008, there was a lawsuit because a man fell down a 200-foot two, cliff in Reading after drinking with a group at the top. The two others that were with him, including one student at the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, believed he was dead and tried to find him for six hours in order to raise him back to life rather than calling 911. Hey, this man fell. Hey, let's... Let's not call 911. Let's let's try to raise him from the dead. The man survived but was paralyzed from the fall and later unsuccessfully sued uh, the student in the group. Uh, they also have participated in what is known as grave soaking. Uh, the school garnered criticism for a practice among some students termed grave soaking, where they would lay on the grave of deceased revivalist and the belief that they would absorb the deceased anointing from God. And we could go on and on and on. Put it this way. Bethel Church in Redding, California has been involved in lots of controversy. They've made news headlines and there's been criticism and a lot of things have been said about them. No question about it. So when we were doing our series where we were visiting, basically uh, virtually visiting the most influential churches in America and we were just listening to their sermons and I was analyzing them, Bethel Church made that list because they're one of the most influential churches in America, all right? Now, why are we talking about Bethel Church now? Well, it appears Bethel Church is offering up a response, or could we put it this way? Bethel Church is trying to clarify what they actually believe versus what people claim they believe. Now, I'm all, I'm all for, now look, 
Bethel Church is a charismatic Pentecostal church. Let's just start right there. I reject charismatic and Pentecostal theology outright. I reject it. I don't think it's biblical. I, I, I've got a million problems with it. But you know what? If a church, if everyone's talking about a church and they're like, hey, let us clarify, let us tell you what we really believe, then you know what? They have a right to be heard. And so we're going to listen and we're going to examine their response. Now, the reason this appears to be, the reason this was brought to my attention is because of a news article posted at christianheadlines.com. I'm reading the article. It starts this way. About a year ago, I sent Bethel an email asking them to clarify a lot of the things that are being said about them. They finally began that process. I don't endorse this church. I'm simply sharing what they are releasing to help clarify what they believe. Here is a page about the project, and episode one was posted here today. Each day, a short-form clip of one of the specific topics will be published. By the second week of July, all of the content for this video series will be published. So they're, they're, I guess, daily, maybe weekly, they're releasing videos saying, hey, here's what we actually believe. Here's what we actually believe. Now, this is what I have done to be as fair as I can be. If you go to theologycentral.net, go to the blog sec- section, you'll see a blog entry called Rediscovering Bethel. It's to their page on their website. So we're not trying to hide the information from anyone. I want you to look at them. Again, I, I reject what they're doing outright, but we are going to examine what they are doing. And here's how we're going to do this. We are just going to start in episode one by grabbing their episode one. We're going to play it, and I'll be interrupting it, examining it. Now, I'm going to examine it by listening to what they claim, trying to understand what they are saying. We're going to, this may, I'm going to try to give, now, remember when the way we're going to examine this. This is very important. My initial examination will be done in real time. All right. What does that mean? That means I'm not listening to this in advance so that I can prepare all of my responses. This is, hey, guys, think of it this way. You drive past the church. Maybe there's four or five of you in a car. You're like, oh, look, he's sitting there at the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church. And I don't know how we ended up here in the middle of nowhere, Texas, but let's stop by and see what he's doing today. You walk through the front door and say, hey, what are you up to? Hey, I'm going to be watching these videos from Bethel Church. Oh, well, can we, can we sit down and listen? Yeah, let's listen together. And then as we listen, I hit pause and I offer in real time my thoughts. I'm going to be offering my, my thoughts in real time. Now, The real-time observation may bring up issues obviously related to systematic theology, doctrine, biblical interpretation, and church history. That may lead to a separate thing, separate from this series, where I do a special episode, maybe even a sermon, dealing with that theological issue. So what we are doing, we are examining Bethel's church attempt to clarify what they believe. We're going to examine it. How are we going to examine it? By listening to it together in real time, responding in real time, not rehearsed, nothing like that. And then based off what happens there, based off your questions, your confusion, we may do additional programs outside of this series related to that specific area of theology, doctrine, or church history. Now, you are going to be very critical in driving this series, right? You ask questions, if you go, well, what about this? I never heard that, or I don't understand that. I can be like, all right, time out. Next week, we'll do an entire hour of teaching on that theological issue, and we'll look at systematic theologies, confessions of faith, commentaries. We'll do maybe a Bible study exercise. A lot of the other things we do, we may do a Greek word of the day based off something they say. We may do a Bible study exercise. We will use a lot of the other series to incorporate them here so that it all comes together. All right, so that's how we're going to do this. Now, if you're listening live and if you have any questions, feel free to jump in. If you have any, if you need me to explain what we're doing, let me know. I'm I'm, I'm right here. The chat is open, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, I think this is going to be beneficial. The goal here is twofold. Yes, I want to know what Bethel is saying. Yes, we want to know what's going on in one of the most influential churches in America. But another reason we're doing this is it really is just another attempt to study systematic theology. Here's a church clarifying their beliefs. They say, here's what we believe. Here's why we believe it. Okay. My question will be, how have people believed that in the past? Does everyone believe it that way? What does, let's, maybe we'll throw out, what does the Westminster Confession of Faith say? 
what does the Puritan catechism say? What does Luther's catechism say? We'll just throw out all kinds of things in church history and go, let's look at that topic from that perspective. And it will be, I think, pretty interesting. And it will uh, just bring a lot of content to all of this. So are you ready? We're going to go to Redding, California. I'm assuming they, they recorded this at their church. Redding, California. Um, in fact, I'm going to pull up the page right here. All right. I'm, pull, I'm, I'm looking at the website right now at Bethel.com, Bethel.com or Bethel.com, right? Won't get into that whole discussion. All right. It says, Rediscover Bethel. And it says this, Rediscover Bethel. Answers to Common Questions and Misconceptions. Rediscover Bethel is a video series that addresses common questions and misconceptions about Bethel Church in Redding, California, specifically regarding our theological beliefs, teachings, and practices. Over the next six weeks, we'll be re- uh, releasing videos over covering topics such as Bible translations, G- Jesus' deity, physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit, Theology of Healing, the Gospel of Repentance, uh, Prophecy, and much more. Watch the videos below to bring clarity and to know the why behind who we are and what we do. Now, I don't know, I don't know exactly if it was that letter written by that pastor that brought this whole series about, or there's just been so much controversy surrounding Bethel Church that they're trying to clarify, maybe to try to help their image, maybe to ensure they're not losing members. I don't, to eliminate controversy, I I can't speak to their motivation, but I'm more than willing to hear them. So we're going to listen. We're going to jump in. Now, the first video that we have here is, hang on, I I hit play, is one hour and 30, one hour and 30, if I can speak correctly, one hour and 39 minutes and 33 seconds. Obviously, it's not going to be complete in one episode. So we're just going to work through this. It's going to be a lot of interruption. And you know what? If I'm going to stop wherever I think we need to stop. Once I think, okay, here's what I really want you to focus on. I will also, I'm going to give you assignments, tell you what to look up, give you challenges, which I always do. Um, anyone who's ever gone to my church knows that I'm always saying, okay, guys, here's what I want you to do. Now, now people at my church at this point just kind of look at me like we're not going to do anything you ask us to do. So nobody does it. New people come in and they'll be like, oh, I got to do this and this. And everybody's like, just don't worry about it. You don't have to do anything, which is kind of sad. But if you want to participate, I can always give you assignments. All right. So are you ready? All right. That's 17 minutes to tell you what we're doing, how we're doing it. Now let's get started. All right. Do you have any questions? If you need me to clarify anything, you can email me, newsif at yahoo.com at any time. If you hear this on YouTube, you can post it in the YouTube comments. By all means, feel free. You are free to email me as well. I think we we should have a celebration really quick. We've reached 100 subscribers on YouTube. I know that seems insignificant, and it is in light of YouTube, but considering we're an audio podcast on YouTube... And we're not, we don't really focus on YouTube. In fact, remember, if I look at all of our statistics for our podcast, YouTube numbers don't even show up on our statistics because it's, there, there are so few of them. And, and, and that's, I mean, we, we bring in maybe about a thousand a day on YouTube and compared to all the other sites, that's not even significant enough to make it in the top 15 of our statistics. So, 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 but it's, I'm glad it's there. I'm glad it's there and hopefully, um, People who find us there will will just go subscribe to our podcast on a podcast app because you'll get everything. You don't get everything on YouTube. There's some things I can't post on YouTube because, uh, yeah, YouTube likes to give us strikes, right? We won't go through all of that. But are you ready? Here we go. Hi, I'm Dan Fairley. I'm a minister at Bethel Church in Redding, California. I'm the dean of our Supernatural School of Ministry, and we're here talking some theology and just get a chance to spend some time together yep. and talk through some of the, uh, the things we're learning, uh, the things we're wondering about, <laughs> and then also just to realize we're part of a larger conversation that the church has been having for 2,000 years, yeah. and the, the followers of Yahweh for longer than that, <laughs> about who God is, what he's up to, what his heart is for us, what his heart is for humanity. And exactly. so we thought we'd spend exactly. some time, um, you know, t- speaking about those things. I love it. Yeah. Well, let's see, we've uh, known each other, I don't know, I knew of you before you knew of me, perhaps. Uh, but yeah. uh, since 91, <laughs> I, I, w- I came to Reading, uh, just finishing right. up uh, 
Bible school in San Francisco at Simpson uh, College at that point. And then I was down at Fuller Seminary in uh, Pasadena. Yeah. Got my MDiv down there. And I got called to be a minister up here uh, at Reading, uh, the college pastor. And then I knew you were up in Weaverville. Yeah. Yep. yep and so yep. how long were you in Weaverville before oh, you came to Bethel? And We were there 17 years. I was on staff at Bethel with my dad for five years. And then he and the eldership sent us up to uh, a daughter church of theirs in Weaverville. And we were there for 17. And then the eldership asked us to come back uh, to the mother church in the end of 95. We came in the beginning of 96. Beautiful. So, and we're yeah. part of a, a church that's been around for almost sixty years or so, yeah, right? It was yeah. a. Uh, it uh, was was it part of the assemblies at at the very beginning? I, I believe it started yeah. in the assemblies, and it was until I don't know twelve years or so ago. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, yeah. I, if I remember the story right, it was a kind of a, a church split, as a, you know, it's scandalous. <laughs> but most church growth happens through church splits. It's a bummer. <laughs> All right, let's stop right here. A couple of things. First of all, I told you I thought they were part of the Assemblies of God, so I I, I wanted to make sure I was correct, so they confirm it, so that's good. They left because of a church split. Now, let me just say this. If you've been listening to our discussion in the Niagara Creed, look, it bothers me but uh, be, I mean, they're laughing about it. And I, and when you've been in ministry for a long time, I understand it's hard not to laugh at it, but it's sad. A, a lot of church growth happens because of a church split. Most church growth happens because of a church split. What, what does that mean? You have a church, it splits, and then those people go to another church and then that church grows. So usually one church grows at the expense of another church. That, that is depressing. It is sad it is frustrating, and it just demonstrates in the Protestant world, churches split so often that that's how other churches benefit. Other churches are usually out there going, man, I wish that church over there would split. If they would split, then those people would come here, and I would grow. Oh. Now, I'm not saying that we consciously say that, but you almost know that, hey, if some other churches would split, there's a good chance we would grow as a result of it. That is sad, but that's the way it works. It's so frustrating, and I just want you to realize this. I don't want to get into a whole discussion about, you know, ecclesiology and the church, but I just want you, once again, I've got to state this. In the Protestant world, I don't care what form of church government you think is biblical. I don't care what form of church government you put in place. When it comes down to it, every Protestant church is led by the congregation. It's congregational led. I don't care what you say. You can have 20 elders. You can have 30 elders. You can have 300 elders. You can have more elders than there are people. But guess what? As soon as the people don't like what you say and what you do, they pack up and they leave. And they will go literally start another church, start another denomination, start another congregation, or go join another uh, congregation. It's like, they will only do, people will only allow you to be in charge as long as they agree with you. The second they disagree with you, they walk away. They wash their hands with you. They will drop you like a bad habit. They don't care how it hurts your church. They don't care how it hurts you. They will abandon you in 5.2 seconds. I know that sounds very pessimistic, but I've watched it happen over and over and over. Hey, pastor, I know it's uh, right between Sunday school and the sermon, but I just want you to let you know that we're leaving. When? Like you're leaving right now? No, no, we're leaving the church. Oh, so you thought it would be a great time to tell me between Sunday school and I'm getting ready to preach. Thank you so much for your wonderful, kind consideration for helping me be prepared for my sermon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for looking out for everyone else who's going to hear the sermon because now I'm so encouraged and I can't wait to stand behind the pulpit and preach God's word. Thank you so much for your kind consideration. And then it's just like, peace out, boom, gone. We don't care what happens to you. We don't care what happens to the church. We're gone. I, and, and so how did they grow? Hey, well, you know, <laughs> let's joke about Let's laugh about it. <laughs> Most church growth happens through church splits. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's depressing. <laughs> Not ideal, but uh, certainly it happens. And then uh, for a while, it was it, an independent work uh, in, in the late 50s, and then it came back into the assemblies at, at some particular time, and then when the Lord was moving on Bethel uh, to kind of create networks and um, 
uh, to have a, uh, it felt like we were trying to do something in somebody else's house yeah. um, uh, to, to do what we were got called to do within the assemblies. And so that's the time that we uh, moved out yeah. of the assemblies. Yeah, we- All right. So they were, I guess they were in the assemblies, left the assemblies, and then came back into the assemblies and then left again. So here's, here's the question. Now, if you, if you listen to, if you've been listening to our series on the Niagara Creed, so, so is a denominational structure, right? Or is it, so it, this is the way I think many people operate. Well, denominational structure, it's okay, but you know what? You don't have to operate within a denominational structure. You can leave the denominational structure and become independent, or you can create some other kind of structure. So what is the actual correct structure of church government? Is it denominational or is it independent? And, and well, clearly they don't, they don't care one way. Well, like, well, you know, we were there, then we came back here, then we went back there, then we came back here. So I guess it's, you know, so I guess is church... <laughs> Is church government uh, only the kind of, it's, it's only what you want when you want it. Hey, you know, when we want to be a part of the assemblies of God, then we're there. But when we need to leave the assemblies of God because we're doing something different, then we can just leave. So that means, that means the denominational structure literally has no authority because when you want to leave, you just walk out. And when you want to come back, you come back. So you don't have to submit to the authority. You can leave the authority whenever you want to do whatever you want. It's just the whole Protestant system of church governance is just so like everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Is it, if denominational is the right form of government, then you need to be a part of a denomination. And if it's not the right form of government, then you should stay independent. But it, people just like, well, you know, it's, it's okay for now, but eh, it's not okay now. Okay, now it's okay. Nope, nope, now it's not okay. It's, it's just... It's just so crazy the way church governance works in, in the Protestant world. We basically asked permission to leave, but, yeah. you know, our relationship with them was good, Absolutely. and it still is. I mean, we just, uh, we really feel indebted to them. In fact, we, we give the same, yeah. you know, the financial support that we gave when we were in the assemblies. We do now. I mean, yeah. nothing. All right, so that's good. They asked for permission to leave. But again, it still comes down to, so is the denominational structure right or is the not denominational structure wrong? Is it, I don't, or is it just pick and choose? Now, it is interesting that they're not part of it, but they still give money to it. That, that, that's interesting. In that sense, it's changed, but, but it's, it, it's difficult to experiment the way we experiment with things uh, that causes problems for other people. And we just yeah. felt it was wisdom to, to, to leave as honorably as we knew how, but yeah. still keep connections. And, and so that's what we've tried to do. So we've worked hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, it, and the Holy Spirit was hitting in unusual ways at that time. And yeah. so that was kind of difficult for the vineyard to navigate, for yeah. the, the assemblies to navigate. Let, let me, <laughs> let's uh, clarify. The Holy Spirit was hitting in uh, some unique ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that means bizarre craziness. That, that's, let me translate that. Bizarre craziness. So, you know, it could have caused them problems. So we didn't want to cause them any problems but because we wanted the Holy Spirit to just do whatever he wanted. I mean, it didn't matter what. It didn't, uh, whatever bizarre manifestation, we didn't want to put any restraint on it, right? And so we didn't want to cause anyone any problems. Now, I guess it's good they didn't want to cause anyone problems, but it just demonstrates the, the how, well, like they're playing it down. Why don't you tell us what those manifestations were? Why don't you tell us how the Holy Spirit was hitting in these unique ways? Let, let's outline exactly what was going on in Bethel. There are some people who have a, uh, I think we have listeners who have some a pretty good knowledge of what was going on at Bethel. Yeah, and I, I believe it's the Heaven Bent, I believe that's what it's called. I don't have it in front of me. The Heaven Bent podcast. And I think this season, season two, is all about Bethel. I'll verify that uh, the next time we're listening. And uh, you may want to go listen to that to get a different perspective or get some insight to what's going on at Bethel Church. We may have to revisit that and just let you hear a part of one of their uh, episodes because, uh, yeah, I think it's a good resource. It's a good resource. I'll look it up here in just a second. All right, let's continue. And so, uh, but, but we don't say that to be critical, but it's just part of, we love <laughs> the global church of, of oh, Jesus. I, I do. And um, it yeah. feels, uh, I get grieved when I hear somebody attacking another believer. Uh, I get, you know, concerned when I hear somebody like, I, I know your motives. Uh, it's like, ah, oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not ideal. And so the, um, uh, the, the value for the church, I think, is 
absolutely central to who we are and what we're doing. Like I, I call the Assemblies of God. I wasn't raised in them, but my pastor had left that denomination and was, uh, you, you know, it was kind of that. Those were his roots. Um, but I call them the. Dr- All right. There we go. Okay. I thought I turned on the microphone, then I turned off the microphone. Okay. All right. I found it. It is called Heaven. Uh, it's the Heaven Bent Podcast. Heaven Bent. All right. You can look this up. Heaven Bent Podcast. And in this season, they are definitely looking at Bethel. They are definitely looking at Bethel. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I'm not going to pull up all the episodes, but the heart of Bethel is the most, uh, is season two, episode eight. Season two, episode seven is called The Devil Himself. Season two, episode six is The Once the once Gays. Uh, season two, episode five, The Outbreak. Season two, episode four, The Power to Heal. So, uh yeah, you can uh, you can look into the Heaven Bent podcast definitely to get more insight into what has happened in Bethel, what happened at Bethel in the past, and then you can compare that to while well, rediscovering Bethel to see if anything dramatically has changed. Again, I would highly recommend you do that. The Heaven Bent podcast, please. And they, someone, uh, they heard the, some of the podcast episodes I did where I was playing some of their uh, episodes. And they were very uh, kind to what we did. In other words, they didn't threaten me with a copyright violation or anything like that. So please, I beg you, go subscribe to the Heaven Bent podcast. Anyone who's nice to us, I'm grateful for uh, because we have so many people who, you know, just it's bizarre how some Christian podcasters will, will, will respond. They did not do anything like that. So go support it. Download it. The Heaven Bent Podcast. Subscribe to it today, wherever you get your podcast. Let me see. Is it available on the Edify Christian Podcast app? Let me look here really quick. I know we're doing this in real time, but that's how this works. Let me um, let me pull up. I don't think it's available on Edify yet. Let me look here. I need to, I need to, if you, uh, some of you have emailed the uh, Heaven Bent people, let them know they need to get their podcast on the Edify Christian Podcast app. All right, please let them know that. All right, let me see here. Heaven Bent. No, it is currently not available there. That is, yeah, we need to talk to them. Oh, no, here it is. Here it is. No, that's me. Never mind. That's, that's my podcast about Good them. Good morning, everyone. That's us. That's my podcast about them. So they're not on the Edify Christian podcast app yet. So let's, if wherever you get your podcast, let me do here. I'm just going to pull up, uh, see what, what do I have here? Um, yeah, you just pull up any podcast app, put in heaven bent. You should be able to find it. I'm going to contact them, tell them to get put, uh, put on the uh, Edify Christian podcast app. Cause they look, if they're, they are covering a lot of the crazy things going on in the church throughout at different times in modern church history. They definitely need to be on a Christian podcast app. They definitely need to be there. So, um, um, well, we'll see if we can help that occur. So but please heaven bent, please subscribe to it. Please download it. It's perfect companion perfect companion with this. I mean, perfect. That's one of the great things about uh, living in the day we live. Whenever we want to research something, we've got all the content in the world available to us. All right. So we will, we will pull some stuff from uh, heaven bent. I guarantee you, we, we may do that to, to contrast some of this. All right. So let's continue. The dread champions of the Lord. I mean, in some ways for the last hundred years, they've been doing an amazing work oh, so, for King so, Jesus. Yeah, Just right. gorgeous work for King <clears throat> Jesus. You're right. So, Some of the godliest people I've ever met are in the assembly. Some of the most courageous people I've yeah. ever met. Some of the boldest, faith-filled people. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I live in... Now, my opinion of the Assemblies of God denomination would be radically different because I would just look at the Assemblies of God statement of faith and I would reject it outright just because of their theology and their doctrine. So obviously me and Bethel would disagree. They think Assemblies of God are wonderful, amazing, doing great work. And I would say Assemblies of God has has, infiltr- has infected American Christianity um, with uh, the, the heresy. I'm going to call it the heresy of the charismatic, uh, of charismatic theology. I, I believe charismatic theology is heretical. I, I just do. I believe it's heretical. I believe it's har- harmful, dangerous. And the crazy things I've seen in, in assembly, again, Assemblies of God Church in Nebraska in the 1990s, the pastor gets hurt in a skiing accident because he's not healed. They fire the pastor because he doesn't have enough faith. Yeah, oh, woohoo! doing great work for the kingdom of God right there. That's, that's some great, yeah, okay, let's continue. 
indebted, very thankful. Beautiful. And so let's yeah. just talk about like your love for the <clears throat> the church in general, not just our particular slice of it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I I I really do. I was <clears throat> excuse me, I was raised in a household uh that really valued the body of Christ. Period. Uh my dad was such a such a, a champion of of diversity. Now, when we say body of Christ, it's people who have it, put their faith in Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. All, okay. People who are born again or yeah. are part of this this thing called the body of Christ, the yeah. church of the living God. Yeah. And uh, and my dad was such a champion of diversity. Uh, you know, you, you hear the phrase, uh, people will say, I want to be celebrated, not tolerated. Yeah. And and he, was, he, he lived that. I mean, mm-hmm. he really, really loved the diversity. He didn't tolerate it. He loved it. And uh, and he would bring people in to minister to us here at Bethel. I'll never forget the diversity of people, but they all had this love for God. They all had a prayer life. They all had this affection for Jesus. They- Let me make it very clear. I don't I don't celebrate diversity. I'm just gonna. Be, I'm, I hate to say this. I do not celebrate theological diversity. Theological diversity, when you're celebrating people who are falling on the floor, barking like dogs, laughing hysterical, laying on top of a grave so you can soak up the anointing, claiming that divine healing is guaranteed to people's psychological damage, saying, hey, you can be healed. Well, so claim it. I don't know why you're being healed. You don't have enough faith. No, any doctrine that does those kinds of crazy things, I don't celebrate it. I don't even tolerate it. I condemn it. I speak against it. It's one thing to say, oh, we we celebrate diversity. Celebrating diversity theologically, no, 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 no. We celebrate orthodoxy. We celebrate biblical, we we celebrate correct biblical interpretation. We We celebrate correct biblical exegesis of the passage. We celebrate correct doctrine. I don't celebrate diversity. I mean, how far do you take that? Well, let's celebrate the diversity of, oh, Mormons. Well, now, now I know it's a, well, no, only people who've truly accepted Christ. Well, who's truly accepted Christ? Who, 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 who do you know? So wait, everyone, can cl- everyone claims to have accepted Christ. Let's test their doctrine and their theology, right? Now, let's test their doctrine and theology. In many cases, how far can you celebrate diversity when one group teaches something completely contrary and opposite and opposed to the previous group, right? Can I celebrate people who tell me that if I don't baptize a baby, that, you know, I'm, I'm withholding salvation from, like a Lutheran. They baptize a baby and it magically becomes a Christian. Can I celebrate that when I clearly don't believe that that's happening? I don't believe that baby became a Christian. I don't believe that ba- baby become magically. I think you got the baby's forehead wet. That's all you did. I don't believe salvation occurred. I believe that baby is just as a sinner as it was before you put the water on its forehead. Right? Others believe, no, I've got to put bab- baptize the baby because it make him uh, the part of the covenant. Now he's a part of the church. I'm like, wait a minute. No, I don't, I don't believe that's the way it works. You, you can't just like, oh, let's celebrate diversity by overlooking the clear doctrinal differences. Now, I don't like the doctrinal differences in the sense that it creates such division and disunity and fighting. But let's not just pretend like, oh, let's just celebrate diversity. Let's celebrate diversity. Now, typically, now I'm, I, I, now, I'm not saying this is what Bethel is doing. I'm not saying that. But here's what I've always found. Heresy, false doctrine, always hides behind a call for unity, for celebrating diversity, for all let's get along. Because if you don't hide behind that, then you open yourself for examination, interrogation, critique. When it's always easy to say, hey, 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 don't critique me. Love me. Celebrate diversity. Let's have unity. Let's love the body of Christ. Yeah, you say that while you promote radically crazy false doctrine. Hiding behind that does not change the fact that either you're preaching the truth or you're preaching lies. It, it's, it doesn't do it. Now, maybe that's the 
fundamentalist in me, the fundamental Baptist in me, because I hold to the fundamentals of the faith, but I think the fundamentals of the faith must be expounded, explained, defended, defined, and no compromise with. And I, I believe the charismatic world is outside the fundamentals of the faith. It's that simple. You say, well, they believe this about Jesus. They, they may believe uh, uh, some correct things about it, but there's so many br- problems with the rest of it that it just, it, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Th- th- there you have it. All right, so I just find it interesting that they're really, that, that, that the rediscovering Bethel starts with this whole idea, hey, let's celebrate diversity. Let's not just tolerate it. Let's celebrate it. Because that, to me, is code for, so don't critique us. Don't, don't look too far into what we believe. We're different than you, but we're both, we're both the same, right? So let's just, uh, let's, let's not look at these doctrinal, di- let's not look at these bizarre manifestations of the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. Let's not look at these crazy things that we've done. No, no, no. Let's not look at false prophecies that we've given. No, 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 no. Let's don't look at in. let's not look at any of that. They all were worshipers. They all loved the scriptures and they had all these things in common. And, uh, and they would come and minister to us here at Bethel when, when my dad was the senior leader. So I, I learned that from him. And in fact, to illustrate the diversity, one Sunday morning, he had a Catholic priest come and speak at this Assembly of God Church. And the very next Sunday, a Baptist evangelist. Wow. And yeah. so that's about as... <laughs> You're going to have a Catholic priest minister to your people? A Catholic priest who the Catholic doctrine of justification, listen, the Catholic teaching on justification is diametrically opposed to the Protestant understanding of justification and the Catholic church at the Council of Trent anathematized you, okay? If you hold to the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone, through grace alone, because of Christ alone, the the Council of Trent anathematizes you. So why would you have a Catholic? We had a Catholic priest, and then we had a Baptist minister. Look at how diverse we are. You know what? That's nothing to be celebrated. That is something for people to pack up their bags and leave as fast as they can Don't look back. Don't look back. You're going to turn into a pillar of salt. Run as fast as you can. Like, why would you have a Catholic priest minister to your people? Like, what did you, what do you mean by that? Did the Catholic priest stand there and just say, hey, guys, I'm going to explain what Catholics really believe. And then next week, your pastor will come up and then offer the Protestant criticism of it. But he wanted to hear it from a pastor, uh, a Catholic perspective. Okay, maybe that's one thing. But you're putting someone who who literally has a false. If the Protestant understanding of justification is right, he has a false gospel. A false gospel. Now, if I remember correctly, now call me crazy because you know, you know I'm uh, I'm one of those mean people who don't tolerate who, who doesn't celebrate diversity. But if my if my Bible is correct, and and you know maybe my Bible is wrong, but my Bible says something along these lines: Galatians chapter one verse six. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Well, if you have a Catholic priest standing in front of you ministering to you, That's preaching another gospel even by default because he represents another gospel because Catholicism teaches a completely different gospel than the Protestant world. It's a different justification. It's not a justification by faith alone because of Christ alone. It's different. Now, I know they will play their little games and claim that it is, but it is different. And Paul says, if someone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Well, Paul doesn't seem to be tolerating or seems to be celebrating diversity there. He's like, no, you have to preach the gospel correctly. 
If you divert from the gospel, it's not another gospel. It's a false gospel, and it is a curse. Let him be anathema. Let him be damned. But, so already, Bethel is <laughs> rediscovering Bethel. I can stop right here and say, I, the only thing I need to rediscover is where the exit sign is. That's what I need to rediscover. Where, where did you put the exit sign? Because, oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. See you later. Let's get out of Dodge. Okay, let's get out of California. Let's get out of Redding. Let's, let's flee to somewhere else. All right. Yeah, that's, that's crazy, 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 crazy stuff going on right there. All right, let's continue verse as you know as you can get i mean it it really taught us because people responded so well we could see what the priest had to say that was so powerful for us and the baptist evangelist and and on and on it goes but a real celebration absolutely yeah in fact my my dad there was a a pastor friend of his here in town that he had uh breakfast or lunch with uh one day and and the pastor uh was from a a denomination that didn't believe quite the same as we did regarding the Holy Spirit. And he, he made a comment to my dad. He said, you guys call yourself full gospel. And he said, I, I really, that really hurts when you say that because it implies you have the full gospel and we have part gospel. And my dad looked at him and said, I'll never use that term again. And wow. he, he dropped it there. He would never use that term again. It, it's well, meaningful. He had, and he had full gospel fellowship guys in his church. Oh, oh, oh totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Made it tough to make announcements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he never used that to describe himself versus another group. It, it, it's kind of an elite term. I don't think it started that way. No, but, no. you know, it, it wasn't, it's not a competition. But it ends up that way. You know, well, we have something you don't have. And there's this arrogance thing. And, and he was such a champion at at valuing what a person had. So Beautiful. I, the, I love that. Talking about that elite thing, we ran into that with our core values at some point, trying to not, at one point we were calling them apostolic distinctions, you know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it works, but uh, it did feel like it was drawing lines and fences that weren't in our heart, that yeah. actually what isn't in our theology, saying these are our distinctives, uh, but actually we started calling them, these are our emphasis, the things the Lord's taught us to emphasize yeah. um, on t- in the global church, realizing that the Lord in his genius beauty <laughs> is calling other denominations, other works to emphasize other things to his glory. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, This sounds like an ecumenical mess. Okay, we don't, want, we don't want to see distinctives. We don't want to see distinctives. This is what God is calling us to emphasize. And he, and his, and the beauty of it all He's calling other denominations to emphasize something else. Well, he, then God is calling me to emphasize that charismatic theology is a cancer and a poison. Hey, you're going to celebrate the diversity? <laughs> right? Well, I mean, well, no, you can't. And, and again, the fact that they had a Catholic priest, like, did the Protestant Reformation happen or did I miss it, that? Did I miss that? What, what, did I wake up and... No, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, okay, breaking news. Did, 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 did. I, that's not a very good breaking news sound. All right, this just in. Martin Luther, he was tired. He did not, I repeat, did not nail his 95 Thesis on the, on the door there in Vic, Wittenberg. It did not occur. It did not. Ha- there was no Protestant Reformation. This just in. The Protestant Reformation never occurred. Never occurred. There is no difference between Catholicism and Baptist and the members at Bethel Church in Redding, California, the Protestant Reformation did not occur. The Council of Trent did not occur. Vatican I did not occur. Vatican II did not occur. All of the, uh, the papal pronouncements and bulls, none of that occurred. None of all the anathemas, all of that's gone. We're all just one big happy family who we, we just believe some different things. But hey, don't bother. Don't go look behind that curtain. Don't go open that closet door. Yeah, we've got confessions of faith that condemn the other side. But let's, let's just ignore the confessions of faith. Let's ignore the creeds. Let's ignore the catechisms. Let's ignore ch- or church history. Let's ignore uh, uh, exegesis of scripture. Let's ignore hermeneutics. Let's just say we emphasize things different than the things you emphasize. Even though what you emphasize contradicts what we emphasize and what we emphasize contradicts what you emphasize, let's just forget all of that because we're all one big happy family. Let's all grab a Coke, have a smile, and sing Kumbaya next to the campfire. All right, that's that's what we're going to do. That's true. He's a a gloriously, you know, gigantic God. He takes a full fellowship in order to accurately reflect who he is and what he cares about. 
That's true. There's many tribes in the nation, yeah. and uh, each one contributes. And I, uh, one of the things I enjoy so much with the travel uh, that I – Now, I've got to say this. I, 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 look, I don't know how else to say this. I'm not a part of your – I'm not – there's many tribes in the nation. I'm not part of your nation. I'm sorry. That whole charismatic cra- – like, just go watch some of the things that's happened to Bethel. That's not my Christianity. I'm not associated with that Christianity. I'm not a part of that Christianity. I don't want any part of that Christianity. I will warn everyone to flee that form of Christianity. We're not. We're not in the same nation. We're not. We're not only we're not in the same tribe. We're not in the same nation. We're not even on the same planet. We're not in the same universe. We're not. And we're, no, we're not together in any way, shape, or form. I don't know what that is. Go listen. Go to listen to the Heaven Bent podcast. Go listen to Heaven Bent. Listen to their expose on Bethel. Just go, and you come back and tell me, oh, that that's my Christianity. Oh, well, okay. Well, then your Christianity and my Christianity, it's not the same Christianity. Well, look, you can you can you can sound all nice and loving and. And all, let's all come together in unity. But I'm telling you, false doctrine, heresy, always hides behind this. It's the mask it wears. False doctrine doesn't show up and go, hey, we've got some false doctrine. It's like, no, look, guys, we're just going to emphasize something a little different than you. We want to celebrate diversity. Look at how diverse we are. Look at how accepting we are. You should accept us. And then you take a bite and it's poison. It's like, come on, it's just a different apple. It's just a different piece of fruit. This fruit won't hurt you. You're not gonna die. It's oh, it's just different. You make your fruit your way. We make our fruit our way. It's perfectly okay. Yeah, yeah until you take a bite and it's rotten to the core because it's false doctrine. I do, I, I travel a fair amount of the year is I'm with uh, so many different groups that are so different mm-hmm. than we are. Mm-hmm. But they'll take the risk, you know, and, and ask me to come. And, and, uh, and I, I love being with them so much. I love, I love even hearing a teaching that in, maybe in some measure contradicts something that I hold dear. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, if it's absolutely against Scripture, then, yeah. then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to struggle. If there's like a zillion gods or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah like, exactly. <laughs> If it's totally against scripture, you're going to struggle. So a Catholic, so Catholicism is in line with your understanding of scripture. So the the Catholic doctrine of justification is in line with Bethel's church understanding of justification. Now, I know they didn't imply, I know they did not try to explicitly state that, but just remember, they went back and just celebrated the fact that they had a Catholic priest preach, right? Right. At some point in history, they weren't condemning it. They, they, they were celebrating it. So, but he only, he will only not accept if, if it goes against scripture. So wait a minute, a Catholic pre, a priest? So Catholicism's doctrine of justification is okay? I'm, I'm completely baffled here. So the example, you know, well, if they say there's a billion gods, I mean, <laughs> we can't accept that. You know, we can't accept, well, wh- how about, what about a one is Pentecostal who denies the doctrine of the Trinity? Can you accept that? Can you accept someone who teaches that justification is not by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone? Can you uh, accept someone who believes in purgatory? Can you accept uh, praying for the dead? I'm just, I mean, I'm curious. Can you accept a church that in a council, at the Council of Trent, declared anathema on anyone who believes in uh, justification by grace alone, through faith alone? I, I'm I'm just curious. So I mean, he's got a line that he won't cross, but obviously it's not a line formed there. At, I guess with Catholicism. So where is that line? Well, like who would you not accept? But but if you know if it's uh, you know I hear somebody uh, I have a friend teach on Calvinism and uh, predestination when I would emphasize free will I love hearing that I, I really do it doesn't offend me at all it, it awakens me to uh, to the, not only the rest of the church but the part of the scriptures I, I that may not stand out to me yeah and uh, and I I really enjoy that journey of walking with other people absolutely so fun <laughs> now. I'm all for 
Now, I mean, I'll try to, I'm going to try to find balance here. I agree with him. I will listen to preaching of people who preach anything. I will listen to it. But I'm not going to like, hey, I'm going to minister with you. I'm, 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 hey, you can come to my church. I can go to your. No, I'm not going to minister to you because either you believe in libertarian free will or you reject libertarian. They both can't be true. <laughs> either it exists or it don't exist. So it, it, this just this is really this is interesting that they're just playing down all doctrinal distinctives. It's just like let's throw out all, now. Maybe for those who are more familiar with Bethel, maybe this is a normal way of operating. But it just seems interesting that they're basically destroying all doctrinal distinctives and playing down all doctrinal differences. That that is a very hey. We're going to reintroduce you to Bethel, and we're going to reintroduce you to us by saying, "Don't worry about doctrinal differences." Don't worry about doctrinal distinctives. We love you. So just accept us. That's almost the way this is coming across. Hey, don't worry about doctrine. So why even outline your doctrine? Why even outline your beliefs? Because what you're basically saying is we shouldn't worry about doctrinal distinctives. So I think it's almost like it's setting you up from a psychological perspective. Hey, you may hear them give some different doctrines, but it's okay because they think you're okay. And because they think you're okay, you should think they're okay. It's almost like a psychological priming the pump. Hey, what? whenever you hear them say that they believe in crazy things, don't worry about it because they think you're okay anyway. So, no, I am not going to fall for that. Just, you know, when we're doing our uh, our membership class, our deeper life class, we talk about every Christian has the Holy Spirit. Yes. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. He's exactly. the, the, in the seal of our salvation, the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father, and exactly. so when, whenever we're making odd distinctions as far as a full gospel or not or charismatic or not or, <clears throat> and we sound like we're, uh, we're drawing these lines against each other based on the Holy Spirit or, yeah. or our interpretation of Scripture, again, not when it's, not when it's the majors, but when it's in the minors, yep. um, I think that it's, it's, it's uh, painful. So what do they do with uh, those within the Pentecostal charismatic world who believe that unless you uh, receive the uh, speaking in tongues, then you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit, so you don't have the Holy Spirit. So can I have the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? So then is that evidence? So th- so then that wouldn't be evidence. So now I'm getting really confused, right? So is speaking in tongues evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? If you say, well, yeah, that's evidence. Well, what if I don't ever, what if I never demonstrate that evidence? What other evidence is there? And what do you do with the groups who say, no, 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 no. Unless you do this and this and this, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Do you reject them? So it's like on one hand, let's play down, like by, by playing down doctrinal distinctives, he just made a doctrinal distinctive that every Christian has the Holy Spirit. Well, then what do you do with those who claim no, unless you do this? Do you reject them? So, and they, an attempt to play down a distinctive, he just made a distinctive. All right. So, all right, let's continue. To experience. And I think, you know, it creates a dissonance and an unclear message. I mean, I was reading again, John 17 and Jesus's love of the unity of the church. Like yeah. he's like, this will actually be gorgeous. <laughs> a billboard saying, yeah. I am who I am. Yeah. Like our unity and our love for each other in the midst of these disagreements and things. We know the apostles were trying to figure out, like, do, do I have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian? And that take yeah. finally they have a council 14 years later, like, no, you don't have to be circumcised. Who to thunk it? You know, they're, yeah, yeah. they're trying to walk through what is the meaning of this, this connection with Jesus. Yeah, exactly. And so, and Jesus on, on the night he's betrayed is like, it's the unity, guys. It's the unity and the love. So that, that's going to be a message to the world of who I am. Yeah. And that I accomplished what I said I would accomplish in yeah. creating a body, a family. Yeah. So yeah. It, we got to do everything we can to celebrate that. The, yeah. And that's the point is we do celebrate. We don't, we can't create unity. You know, there's a lot of unity movements trying to create unity. Paul says in Ephesians 4 to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So when the Holy Spirit has true influence over my life, I'm going to live without offense as somebody who thinks differently than I do. And it's the it's that measure of his influence on how I think, yeah. how I see, how I value another person. It doesn't mean uh, our differences disappear. No. It just means our value for one another. Uh, you know, there's that conviction of you as a as a a, a person the Holy Spirit dwells in. Mm-hmm. I've got to value that. Yeah. I have to treat with 
great respect that fellow believer. And, and that's, that's the whole thing. Preserve the unity of the Spirit. In fact, in John 17, he says, I gave... Do you preserve the unity at the expense of doctrinal distinctive? Do you preserve the unity by undermining doctrinal distinctive? Or do you preserve the unity in spite of doctrinal distinctive? Now, they already said they don't like the distinctive idea. They're just going to use emphasis. So they seem to have already indicated playing down doctrinal distinctives. So we're going to protect and preserve unity at the expense of doctrinal truth. That is not the way to do it. That's not the way to do it. Now, yes, I wish there was unity. I wish there was unity, but I can't be unified with Catholics who have a completely different doctrine of justification unless I reject my understanding and accept theirs or they reject theirs and accept ours. I can't uh, have unity with someone who says you have to baptize babies so that they will go to heaven when I reject that. I can't have unity with someone who says you can lose your salvation. I can't have unity with someone who rejects the doctrine of the Trinity. I can't, I mean, we can go on and on and on and on and on and on. Like, there, there can't be, like, protect the unity, but not at the expense of truth. Give them my glory. That's the manifested presence of Jesus. Yeah. Wow. I gave them my glory that they might be one. Yeah. So the whole concept of us being united together is the result of his presence. Yeah. It's not the result of some ecumenical movement. I don't mind not those, through, but not that's... Not perfect agreement or you no. got to lay down anything offensive. And as soon as you and I, as soon as you think like me, we can actually walk together. Like, yeah. Oh. Yeah, what do we do? that's not <laughs> unity, that uniformity. <laughs> yeah. You, real unity, I, I believe, requires diversity. Mm. It's, it's the only way you can really tell that you have unity. Otherwise, it's everybody's, you know, it's the cookie cutter Christian where we all look and talk the same. That's not good for us. Yeah. It's, not good, it's not good for me just to be, to be around people who agree with me. Yeah. It's just not healthy. I, I need, you know, the rock tumbler, you know, with the sharp yeah. edges of the yeah. rock. We, we, we're together, and it helps to bring that glory of, of Christ out of our lives through, yeah. our, through our fellowship together. So, so I often wonder, like, am, you know, uh, am I going to get to heaven? What am I going to find out I had wrong when I get to heaven? <laughs> I mean, do, you ever, yeah. do you ever have that thought? Like, oh, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. It's going to be a, an awakening. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's interesting when you think, if you play that through, you're like, is it, am I going to have spiritual pride? Like, oh, yeah, I got that one right. Like, you know, I'm in heaven, like, right, keeping right, a tally right. of what I had right versus right. somebody else. I'm like, oh, no, I, I hope not. I hope that's all killed in me, yeah. uh, you know, before I get into the <laughs> presence so of the funny. Lord. So but funny. if you're, if you can take joy in each other, you're like, well, you guys really nailed that. Like, we yeah, did not have funny. that right. <laughs> you had that super right, you know. Um, I like that. And so I, I, that thing, when the expectation like of delight yeah. and how my sister or my brother yeah. really articulated it so much closer, more accurately than I was able to understand, like, I... I expect that to be part of the joy of heaven uh, as I'm trying, you know, beginning to understand who God is. But do you have that, I, that same deal? That- I, I like that. <laughs> oh. I do. I like that. I, 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 I live with the awareness that he's going to adjust things that I think when I get there. Yeah. That, you know, I, there's nothing that I'm thinking that I know is wrong. Right. Or yeah, I, well or said. I, or yeah, we're not trying to purposely be inaccurate ever. Exactly. Like we're trying to be as exactly. the best articulation of who God is, what he's up to, that we can. All right, we'll have to stop there because we're over an hour. Fascinating first, I mean, we didn't even get done with this episode. We still got an hour and 26 minutes to go in this episode. So it's going to take a while to examine all of this. I'm I'm just kind of fascinated by the approach. The approach is very interesting. It's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to clarify what we believe, but we just need to make this very clear. Hey, we love you. You love us. Let's have unity in the midst of diversity at the expense of doctrinal distinctives. That, that seems to be where this is going. And it's just, why even clarify what you believe then? It should just be like, hey, guys, Bethel, at Bethel Church, we believe a lot of different things. And sometimes there's some strange manifestations. But you know what? Uh, you, we need to be unified. So you, uh, celebrate our diversity. We'll celebrate that you don't have these things going. We'll celebrate the fact that we have these going and somehow we can all get along. Even if you're a Catholic priest, even if you're a Baptist evangelist, we're all just one big happy family and it's all wonderful. And Jesus said unity. So unity means unity. And let's not worry about the doctrinal distinctives. That That seems to be the message here. And I will argue this is always how False doctrine hides itself. It, I, I just, it always emphasizes the unity 
and and the acceptance because because then that that means hey in other words I'm not going to fight with you I'm not going to argue with you we should celebrate our differences we we just emphasize this you emphasize something different can we all get along okay great now that we can get along good now we're going to emphasize all of this false doctrine and you shouldn't be very critical of it and you shouldn't examine it and you shouldn't be uh, you know you shouldn't point it out and you shouldn't condemn it because that's not very loving and that's not very that's not very nice and, and that's not being very unifying and that's not protecting and, and preserving the unity and you need to preserve the unity well you're never supposed to preserve the unity at the expense of false doctrine that's why Jesus says beware that there are false prophets there are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing Paul warns the elders at Ephesus that false teachers are going to arise from your midst. Be uh, Paul in Galatians, if someone brings to you a different gospel than we preach, let them be accursed. That is not celebrating diversity. That is in no way, shape, or form downplaying doctrinal distinctives. So I'm just somewhat baffled by, is this, is this a common approach? Is this a common approach? I don't know, but I think it's one that we have to be on the lookout for. All right. And so we will pick this up next time. All right. Everyone have a wonderful Sunday evening. And uh, well, let me know what you think. What, what do you think? Now, this I know this is going to bring up a separate issue. Now, now, remember, this is real time observation, but I'm very aware. Now this brings up. So how does unity work? How can you have unity? What kind of unity can even exist in a Protestant Christianity where you have thousands upon thousands of Protestant groups with all kinds of divergent doctrinal distinctives that contradict one another and in many cases condemn one another? How do you have any kind of, is there any hope for that kind of unity? Where, what happened to the unity? Where did it all go wrong? Now, those are questions, and maybe we'll have to address that separately. The goal here was just trying to figure out what Bethel is doing, but they do raise some important points there, and we will have to discuss that at a later time. All right, you can email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a wonderful evening. God bless.